Let's say for the sake of discussion, you and I get into a time machine and bring this along. Go back about 50 years, then we find a group of like-minded car guys, and we tell them this, a Porsche from the future. What do you think their reaction would be? Aside from disbelief, they would probably laugh in your face. But what they don't know, this, for 21 years now, has not only paid the R&D budget, but has handed technology down to Porsches they couldn't even imagine would exist in the future, which has transformed the company they know and love into something they wouldn't recognize much like this, which is the reason why you and I have to look at the dot two of the third generation of Cayenne. So first things first, what exactly is a dot two of the third generation of Cayenne? Well, it's just like the dot two of like a 991 or a 997. It's a refresh within the Porsche life cycle, which lasts about seven to eight years. Uh, this, as you can see, is the coupe version. They are still on offer as an SUV, meaning there's utility back here, and the coupe, which there's no utility back here. But there are a number of big differences that come into play here. The first of which, and probably most noticeable even to non-car folk, would be the schnoz. Now, I never like to tell you guys what you can see. I'll let you make your own opinion on this. But the logic was to tie it more to the electric cars we've already seen in terms of design theme, which something tells me that will tie into cars coming up down the road. Now, putting aside the futuring and design, there is another change here that is meant for today, and that would be the arse end of the car. The folks at Porsche tell me there are a number of changes back here. I can only see really one that stands out, and that would be the tail lamp. And this, this is something we've been seeing as a trend for the past couple of years, and one of the vehicles that started it was the Taycan. But here we've been seeing this 3D lens in the back, even on recently the BMW XM. Here it's alive and well in the Dot 2 of the Generation 3 Cayenne. But anyway, let's move away from the changes that would be impressive to the majority of the 95,000 folks that bought one of these things in 2022 and focus on the bits that speak to us car guys, and that would be some of the changes in the propulsion system. Now, there are different flavors on offer like other Cayennes, but at launch, there's gonna be a hybrid, there's going to be a Cayenne S, a Turbo GT, and then there's gonna be the base one with a V6. Now, of course, there's probably gonna be a GTS and a Turbo and some sort of like turbo plug-in hybrid if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly. And thus we arrive at what I would argue is the most important change, especially for us car folks, and that would be the Cayenne S. Yeah, the Goldilocks one that we learned in the dot one version of this, where it was the 443 horsepower turbocharged V6, and with the right chassis options, it was beautifully balanced. It wasn't the kind of car that would set your hair on fire like the Turbo GT, but it wasn't the three liter single turbo V6 that was just kind of there. Now, all the S's come standard with a four liter turbocharged V8. Now that translates to 25 more horsepower. Talk more about the changes from behind the wheel, but in terms of performance figures, zero to 60 for something this size, 4.4 seconds and VMAX 169 miles an hour. If we're being direct Cayennes, they've never been known to be lightweight. This, no exception, 4,874 pounds, or depending on express your weights and measures, 2,210 kilograms. With that, that's about 275 pounds lighter than the last Cayenne you and I drove, which was the Turbo GT. With that, Sport Plus mode. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, this, yeah, definitely delivers power like other Turbo V8s in a Cayenne. Although this is a bit different, it's not tuned as immediate from the get-go, basically. All the torque is not coming on crazy amounts, like in the Turbo GT or even the Turbo that we previously have driven. Uh, this spools up about 2,000 RPM is really where this thing comes live. Now, something important to understand, this engine, it's not exactly a detuned version of the GTS or the Turbo GT. Yes, it's the same four liter twin turbo V8, but they made some changes here. Uh, instead of dual twin scroll turbos, it's dual single scrolled turbos. Now, why is that important? 
Well, from what I understand, it's more immediate in forcing induction into the engine, and that works in conjunction with another change. It's a higher pressure turbo system. Now, something really important to understand here, this is not like other Porsches in that it's a dual clutch transmission. It's not a PDK. This is a Tiptronic 8-speed automatic. Why is that important? Meaning it's not two clutches. Instead, it's an old school torque converter system. This still has a precision, but not quite to the level of the PDK. And you definitely lose a little speed in the shift. Anybody that's driven a Cayenne before, there really isn't any difference here. Now, it would stand to reason the changes, they extend to the inside. But here, this is an area that's more difficult to change for, say, a Porsche than a Hyundai or a Kia of the world. Because Porsche, they have, what, 70 years of design themes that were set by the early 911s. And that has shaped the interior design of pretty much every Porsche, not just sports cars. Here, they've taken some influence from the Taycan, which itself did take some very roundabout influence from the 911, in that it's got the same gauge cluster, if you can call it that. It's really a screen, and what they've done is they've rendered the gauges from a 911 digitally into the screen. But this one, they've gone with that hoodless thing like they did in the Taycan. And there, when I first drove it, I'm like, this is going to be a problem. It's going to be a train wreck with glare. Even, I have to admit, now driving probably six of them at this point, I've never had an instance where glare is an issue. So I'm not concerned about this design theme where they've taken the hood off of it. I have to say it just looks goofy to me. Me personally, I would like the hood there simply because that's the way the dashboard of a European car looks. Now, the gauge cluster, this can be changed much like the Taycan, where I can go in here and go through this thumb wheel, and I can change the way the thing looks. So I can make it look more modern, like the kids these days want Teslas. Uh, and I can go to a minimalist view as well. Uh, then they've got this updated PCM. So this is now the third version of their UX. This UX paradigm was introduced with the Taycan. Now, what do I mean by that? Just look at it. If you've used an iPad, an iPhone, even an Android device, this should look familiar to you. But what's more fascinating, they have a menu that's consistent no matter where you are in the UX. So let's say for the sake of discussion, I go into the settings. The menu is the same here. And then like early Macs, they literally have a graphical user interface that's consistent throughout each different application. Now, moving to some other bits here, there's very familiar cues from Porsche. Like, most of the stuff you see here is fitted as an option. The lovely seats, the Sport Chrono. But one thing that's changed here is the start-stop switch, which, yes, it's got the Le Mans start over on the side. Instead of it being that thing you turn, now it's just a button you push. Now, as our discussion moves into driving dynamics, this is an area that one would say that didn't really need to change with a Cayenne, because I would argue it's one of the most capable SUVs out there, like to the point where it doesn't embarrass itself against other cars on roads like this. Like, I feel totally confident here. But what's different with this version? Uh, well, they made a couple of changes, some we can sample and some we can't. Uh, the basic suspension, which is a steel spring setup, it now comes fitted with PASM as standard, see adjustable dampers. But they also changed it to a two-valve setup, so they can separate damping and rebound. That sounds lovely, but you and I, we can't test that here because all of the, I think they flew four cars over from Germany, all of them are fitted with the air ride that we have experienced before. Now, they did make a couple of changes to the air ride. It's not like the Panamera where it's a three chamber. This is a two chamber. They've made those chambers smaller. Now, why is that important to us? Well, the idea, at least given to me from the Porsche engineers, it can fill the air chamber faster with air so it could be more responsive in aggressive driving situations like this. Do I notice a difference from any previous Cayenne that we've driven? If I'm honest, no. All I can say is this car is still 
just as sharp as it was before. I think the best way to describe the changes here, it feels more connected or you feel more connected to the vehicle. Now, one of the things that may be contributing to that is the four wheel steering system. Now that's not a change from previous Cayennes. It's still optional, unlike the PASM, which is now standard across the board. But here what they've done is they've taken the same hardware, but they've programmed it differently. So now the rear wheel steering system comes in sooner. So it's a little bit more immediate in its assistance, especially when you're dealing with these kind of situations and high speed stability. It is a noticeable difference. You do not feel the wheelbase. Not that this is a particularly long vehicle, but you don't feel that almost 48, 4,900 pounds. That is a big function of all these pieces coming together. Then there's the actual front steering. Again, like other Cayennes, this, it's direct. The weight, I don't want to say it's perfect, but it's unusually good for a vehicle this large and this tall. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game on the options game with today's contestant. The car that's often referred to as the most important Porsche. Well, let me spell that out for you. This makes up 30% of Porsche's worldwide sales. This generation, the E3.2. Specifically, we are looking at the Cayenne Coupe S for a base price of $102,100. Which brings us to a prudent question. How much is the most basic one SUV with the V6 single turbocharger? That's quite a bit cheaper at $79,200. Now that brings us to another prudent question. What if we want the one that's more practical, the one they call the SUV that brings about more metal? How much is that? Believe it or not, more metal translates to less money, $95,700. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, the Turbo GT is $196,300 that only comes as a coupe. Then there's this one. Now we could go through every single option, but the problem is there are 33 factory options fitted to this specific car. So with that in mind, let's make this entire process a lot more efficient and hit just the highlight starting with that stunning color, which is new for 2024. It is called Montego Blue. It is also a bargain at $850. Now this car has a stunning contrast between the interior and the exterior. That's why I chose it over testing the Turbo GT today. That is Mojave beige and black two-tone interior with leather. That is $4,180. Then the seat belts to match those seats. Mojave beige, that is well worth it at $600. Head-up display, $1,490. The Burmester stereo that we love so much that we used to piss and moan at four and $5,000. Well, that's now $7,000. Then the designers in Zuffenhausen spent so much time making the front of the car look cool. Why not pay extra for fancier matrix LED headlights? $1,700. Then we have to get into the important chassis options, which I would argue transforms the Cayenne and really shouldn't be optional. They're also not cheap. Porsche Torque Vectoring, $1,500. The air suspension, $2,090. Those RS 22 inch spider wheels. I don't love them. There were better options in wheels uh, back at the motoring club in LA. This five spoke was stunning, but this $2,540. Then we get into the PDCC, $3,590. Sport Chrono, $1,140. Then technically not a chassis option, but it does make the car more interesting. The Sport Exhaust. $3,220. Now all of that brings us to a retail price of $133,950. However, this car has things like the trim and the satin finish, night vision, uh, insulated glass, all that kind of stuff that adds another $17,230. Then we add the destination and handling for $1,650 which brings us to a total retail price of $152,830. Now let's you and I pick up that conversation about the interior and discuss how it impacts the driving experience. Uh, over the past couple of years, Porsche, like many others, have been moving to this haptic feedback like glass, glossy black interface. We first saw it on this current generation of Panamera. And that was disappointing because the Panamera, it was 
it was a pilot's wet dream because it had all these buttons up and down this long console. It was magnificent. But then it, it lost something. But here they clearly have taken some learning, meaning probably very angry customers in the Taycan that said, you know, some of this doesn't work. Like, for example, the screen for the HVAC, it's a screen. You have to go in there and look at the screen to change the HVAC. Here, they have five toggle switches. That's one more than on the current generation of 911. And it covers all of the frequently used items like the fan speed, the temperature, even the air conditioning compressor is now a toggle switch. This is what I have been bitching and moaning about for years and we finally have it. Now while we're talking about the HVAC system, remember that goofy setup with the vents they had in the Taycan where you have to go into the screen to adjust the direction of the airflow? Beyond stupid, yeah, like spaceship type stuff, but we don't need that complexity here. Notice, I just do this old school vents. I can move it up. I can move it down. I can move it to the side. I can move it to the other side. I can do the same thing over here on the outboard position. I don't have to go into some ridiculous screen to change this. Can I say, vielen Dank. This is now somewhere between BMW and what many Asian car manufacturers are doing. So this is something that is now a reference that other manufacturers should look at as a way to make updates while simultaneously balancing, wait for it, safety, technology, and most importantly, old world charm. So what have you and I learned today? Well, to answer that, I feel I need to be very succinct with you about vehicles like this, meaning SUVs that are German, fast, and rather expensive. There are two gold standards in the segment. For a three row, there is the Mercedes GLS and nothing else. And in this one, meaning two row, it is absolutely the Cayenne. And here with this refresh of the third generation, it's still very much the gold standard. What's interesting here, this is not so much about making it better or more competitive with other vehicles. I would argue all of these changes were to bring the vehicle up to the consistency of the Porsche lineup moving forward, meaning future cars, which brings us to a very obvious question. Where is this going? Porsche tells me there will be a full EV, not just a plug-in hybrid of the Cayenne, somewhere in the middle part of this decade, but it really is the third in line to get a full EV. First will be the Macan, second will be the sports cars, to you and I, that means a Boxster and a Cayman Electric. Which brings us to the wish list, and this being the first of the E3.2 Cayennes you and I are driving, I have three things. Number one, the plans sound great. You want to do electrification, you want to plug-in hybrid, all these different turbo V8s, that's wonderful. But these are not cheap vehicles. How about we figure out a way to get 500 pounds out of these things and increase the driving dynamics by lowering the weight? Second wonderful changes on the inside and I take my hat off to Porsche for admitting they were wrong in certain areas and putting back in some analog controls that obviously was based on feedback from Taycans that are now out, believe it or not, four years. Then we get to the third item. You can definitely tell this V8 is a little handicapped to the GTS and the Turbo that we drove by design because it's the lesser model, which tells me if we're going to have a GTS and a Turbo and a Turbo GT, there needs to be more delta between these vehicles because short of the coming GTS and even Turbo being a better combination of bits, performance, and money, I don't see why one would choose those over this. So there I'm asking for a much larger delta Delta than what exists today, which means the Turbo GT would need some more Delta, maybe go in a different direction with some electrification and more range. But I'm just one man, and this is the point of the episode that I turn around to you guys to opine in the comments below or via our social media, Motoman TV onward, Motoman TV onward, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, if you got value out of this episode, I would greatly appreciate you sharing them with all your friends. And as for YouTube, it helps us greatly if you click subscribe, notifications, and of course, the like button. Till I see you in the next episode, bis später.